show when I was... I got in a little bit later than normal. Not late by any stretch, but just normal than I than I like because I was wrestling with the show this morning. Twin Cities News Talk. My name is John Justice, producer Robbie in there. State Representative Walter Hudson joins me in studio. Good morning, Walter. Good, Good morning. morning. I don't know if you've ever had those moments when you were doing a show when you're putting things together and you're kind of going, I don't know, do I have enough material? Do I have enough content? And it's on a rare occasion, but this morning I was kind of looking at a snapshot of everything and I'm like, all right, I don't know where these particular items are going to go. And today ended up being one of those mornings that, uh, that's actually taken off in a direction that I, I wasn't expecting in definitely a positive way. There's been more than enough commentary, especially from uh, the uh, the listeners uh, this morning. I guess all of that is to say, Walter, that Tuesday has a feel. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I get that. that. Yeah, yeah, when, when I, I used that, to have an evening, evening show, show here on Twin Cities News Talk, my time, my time slot was originally 9 to 11, which is super late, and then, and then I got upgraded to 8 to 10, <laughs> so that was a little bit of a... <laughs> it did come, come with a pay increase, increase of course not, but, but uh, it did come with more prestige, and yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I used to, to challenge, challenge myself just, just for fun, fun. and sometimes out of necessity because I, I worked a job where my hours were variable to come in here with the least amount of prep possible and see if I could make it through the two hours. Nice. And there, and there were certainly a couple of nights where I definitely was dancing right along the precipice of complete collapse. See, I could never, I'd be too terrified. I could never allow myself to do that. I just, that's for me. I always, if you ask Robbie, I over, I over prep. Sure. Um, and I'm not going to get to the majority of what I had grabbed for this morning's show. All right, before we dive into, and you can feel free to chime on this as well, before we dive into uh, the stack that I have for discussion this morning, we've been covering a lot of different uh, topics today. Uh, we will get in to the arrest of the DFL Senator Nicole Mitchell. Um, I don't know if there's any new information to uh, to share, but are those that are just catching up, we'll give you the details as of as of late. I want to get your thoughts on the students marching in Anoka Hennepin mm-hmm. after the school board member uh, put out his essentially list of things they he believes, and I agree with him, he shouldn't be taught, and they're holding the budget hostage, for lack of a better way to put it. Mm-hmm. And on top of this, we were talking about the protests taking place on the campuses around the country, yeah. uh, the anti-Semitism. I want to go to this uh, this comment uh, here. Hey, John. Um, it drives me crazy that someone who is so concerned about saving babies' lives here uh, doesn't care about the genocide that Israel is committing. And um, just because the media might not be framing it that way because it's holding its breath for a World War III, doesn't mean you can speak for the people uh, protesting and double speak your way out of it. And I don't know. You're the biggest hypocrite when it comes to this. To the last part, I don't know exactly what you're referring to for me speaking to the people protesting. I think the people protesting, and if you're referring to the um, the protests taking place on college campuses, those individuals are doing a fine job on their own speaking for themselves. They're being very clear in what they are protesting. To Israel committing genocide is pretty simple. I don't believe that they're committing genocide. They are attempting to destroy Hamas. It's a terror group that unprovoked decided to go into Israel and murder some 1,200 Jews. This is an act of self-defense. And the Jewish state is going to great lengths to prevent civilian casualties. But you know what? War is hell. And if you want to blame anybody for any casualties that civilians, uh, the civilian casualties taking place in Gaza, you should be looking at Hamas. You should be looking at the organizations that are funding Hamas and turn your attention that direction. Because in my view, Israel's got every right to do what it is that they are doing right now. But I welcome um, further clarification on your comments if you wish to leave a uh, uh, talk back. And Walter, if you care to comment on, uh, on the uh, talk back as well, please do. Yeah, yeah I, can I can only assume the talk backer is 100% pro life. Otherwise, accusing you of hypocrisy is one of the most absurd accusations that could possibly be leveled. That seems to be implicit in the argument. It, was, it wasn't stated well, but the implied implication was that in order to to be justifiably against the killing of babies because they're unwanted, you must also be for preserving a political entity that has as part of its declaration of existence the purpose of exterminating the Jews from the river to the sea. I mean, that's what their founding documents say. That's about as incoherent of a position as I've ever heard. Um, it is... 
the position held by the anti-Israel left and the so-called pro-Palestinian protesters, that is their position. Their position is that in order to preserve life and before life, you have to be supportive of an entity that has, as its founding declaration of purpose, the genocide of the Jews. I mean, I mean the, the circular, circular logic is something, something to behold. behold. Um, but but the, yeah, I think, I think the, the other kind of the deeper kernel here, here and this, this, by the way, transcends partisan divides. divides. We've got people on the right who are starting to think this way as well. Oh, sure. Tucker, Tucker Carlson said something utterly ridiculous recently in reference to uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the choice uh, of the United States to drop bombs on those countries in the midst of World War II, which, by the way, ended World War II. We, we seem, seem to have adopted, adopted this post, this, this kind of post sector, or what's, what's the word that I'm looking for? Postmodern. That's yeah. the word I'm looking for. This, this sort of postmodern post idea uh, after, after World War II, II that war should never be won definitively. That, that the, the only, only proper response to military, military aggression, which is what we saw on October 7th in Israel, uh, in a, a horrific terrorist attack. attack Involving, involving all sorts, sorts of atrocities that I can't even explicitly describe here on the air for fear of you losing your ability to be on the air. Yeah, please don't. Um, the, 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 the idea that the only proper response to that is a so-called proportional response. Um, no, we, we, we don't need to slap them on the hand. We don't need to make them stand in the corner and wear a dunce cap. We need, we need to, to end, end them. them. We, we need, need to neutralize them. them. We need to put them in a place where they can't harm another living soul ever again. again. Now, now, that's, that's going to take the form of two possibilities. possibilities. One, their unconditional surrender, or two, two their utter destruction. destruction. That's, that's how, how war works. works. And, uh, and uh, we, we, we're living in an age where folks on both sides of the aisle seem to have forgotten how civilizations have functioned since the beginning of time. Um, um, we, we do, do not, not live, live in a world, world and we never will live in a world, world where you'll be able to defeat evil through tolerance. tolerance. Yeah. Let's go to a uh, comment with regard to the talk back. Hi, John. Regarding the caller that called in to try and correlate abortion with Israel defending themselves, something she needs to remember. If Israel stopped fighting against Hamas today, Hamas would continue to try and kill every Israeli that they could. Yep. If Hamas stopped trying to do any fighting or killing, Israel would stop as well. Well, and I, and I wish that. And thank you for the uh, for, for the comment, Deanna. I I appreciate the 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 comment from the woman challenging me on the show i just wish that we would have another layer of of honesty going on here and i w and that that's everything that you just laid out everything that that talkbacker laid out you know let's have that let's have that conversation if this is what your belief is if you are siding with the pro-palestinian crowd and the anti-semitism taking place on the college campuses right now then let's just be honest be honest with me i won't come back at you i won't fight you on it. if that's what you believe if that's if that is your ideology and what you believe and you're siding with those individuals then just be up front rather than trying to take a run at me and calling me a hypocrite step up be a little bit more honest about your views on it, and then we can move forward. Because I think what will end up happening is we will have to, as respectfully as we can, agree to disagree on the on the fundamentals. I want to bring up something you mentioned a moment ago, which I thought was interesting, and and that is yeah, the number of individuals on the right right now that seem to be pivoting in different directions. I haven't quite put my finger on it yet. I. I tend to lean into it happening because we are seeing and everybody's got a right to their opinion. I don't want to, you know, I, I want to make sure I'm clear about that. But I, I tend to pivot towards individuals becoming more genuine in their in whatever foundation they are deriving their views and opinions of. And perhaps we're seeing just a fundamental you know, baseline difference between 
individuals like you and I and what we believe at our core that drives all of our thinking and what they believe at their core, even if they may be conservatives. That's the first place my mind goes as to why we're seeing this deviation away from, I think, what you and I would look at as being more rational, common sense commentary and moving something, you know, moving closer to what we're hearing from from the left. I don't know if you have any ideas on where you think this is this is coming from. I mean, the, the Tucker in particular is difficult to comprehend where he's coming from because he's too smart to just be tripping into this position Sure. Uh, Willy nilly. I, I trust that he's thought it through and has some rationalization. And I don't want to speculate as to what that rationalization may be. But it more generally, I think what drives this type of thing, because, you know, look, I, I came into this activism by the Tea Party. I was a Ron Paul guy. I was the vice chair of the Republican Liberty Caucus at one point. My soul, my heart and soul is libertarian. But, but I, I have, have never been, been able to get on board with what is kind of you might call the mainstream libertarian view of foreign policy. And the reason why is because it's criminally naive. It's, it's absolutely ridiculously naive. What, what Ron, when Ron Paul talks about ISIS, for instance, or Iraq or Afghanistan or, or any of these foreign entities, what he does is he projects um, Judeo-Christian American values upon the perspective and worldview of these other nations and our rivals and enemies around the world. They have a different worldview. They have a different base morality. They don't value things the same way that we value them. And acting as though if you, you could just sort of trade your way uh, to peace with somebody who is fundamentally committed to your destruction, that doesn't work. Sometimes you actually have to end the threat. And it's what, what's, I think what drives me nuts in the conservative space right now, and there's just so many different directions we could take, um, is the lack of consistency of thought, right? So we seem to be really good at recognizing in the, in the realm of personal self-defense and Second Amendment rights, right. the idea that past a certain point, you can't negotiate with somebody who's invading your home, which will become relevant to another story we'll sure. talk about here sure. in just a moment. Um, and past that point, you have to use force up to and including force that could potentially end somebody's life, right? And of course, that's tragic. Of course, that's not what you want. But they entered your domain. They trespassed against you. You have to defend yourself. And if rationally, in the moment, the only means to do so is by deploying a level of force that's potentially going to end their life, that is something you have the right to do. As conservatives, we all kind of universally agree with that. But for some reason, there's a large segment of us that don't apply that same principle to the relationship between nations. If a, if a nation is going to literally hang glide into your stadiums and start pillaging and killing people and engaging in atrocities that, again, I can't describe in detail on the air. Right. Um, past that point, you have to end them. You have to destroy them or secure their unconditional surrender. Those are the only two options. They, they have demonstrated that they are beyond reason. And when somebody is beyond reason, they have to be dealt with by force. Well, and I think there's a lot of confusion and a... It's not an excuse, um, uh, Walter Hudson, but I think there's a lot of confusion when it comes to what you're speaking to in the examples of how we're dealing with illegal immigration. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that force needs to be used and we need to go to that level. But when people see the fact that we're allowing an invasion into this country, not only allowing an invasion, but you have politicians that are going yeah. in and actually – Wanting to fund those individuals and, you know, giving them, you know, the means to function as if they are legal citizens within the country. Right. The the issues that swirl around this that are all under this umbrella, put it that way, they become diluted. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where a lot of times people they're they're to what you were saying earlier. 
they're not rationally thinking all of these particular matters through to their varying uh, degrees. And again, it's not an excuse, but I think that's part of the reason why you're seeing it. They're, they're looking at these through different lenses when really we are essentially talking about the same action being perpetrated against you or a particular right. or a particular country it's right. there's a lot and listen just one more quick aspect to this the when you have the narratives that are running into each other on the one hand you've got schools that are you know indoctrinating our students it can't even be debated anymore mm -hmm. over affirming a a child's choice relating to their gender pushing back against just basic science. Mm -hmm. And you have laws that are being crafted to affirm that. Now you have protests taking place on college campuses. They feel they have, they have their free speech. They have their views. Very anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. Very hateful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But make no mistake, those individuals... Consciously or subconsciously, they're looking about what's happening in other parts of society, saying, if their feelings matter most and they can be affirmed, then so can ours. And at what point do we reach a level where that ends up being taught in commonplace in our schools, where that type of mentality and what they're protesting and only one side of the argument, say, relating to Israel and, and the Middle East ends up being being taught in our schools as well. I mean, I've gone way down the line here, but like I said earlier this morning, I refuse to ignore the slippery slope any longer. Well, it's, it's, it's not a slippery slope per se. It's just a, you're again, you're being consistent in your thought process. You're saying if the underlying premise of the woke argument is applied to all things, what will the result be? Um, and that's a rational projection, uh, a, a rational prediction of the direction things are going. Indeed, if we continue to teach in our schools that the currency of social dynamics is power, not value, <laughs> but power, <laughs> if we continue to teach that, if we continue to teach critical race theory, if we continue to teach wokeism, then yes, indeed, you will only churn out people uh, who are of the type that they're going to take a Hamas flag like modern day Nazis and march down the street of American institutions taking the side of genocidal maniacs. That's where we're at and where we're going unless we make changes. All right. Let's go here because we've got another different places we want to go. Um, let's go back to a story that I started the show off with today. And that is the Democrat Minnesota Senator Nicole Mitchell arrested Monday morning Detroit Lakes for alleged burglary. Um, from what I know, she was still uh, in jail as of 430 yesterday afternoon. I don't know whether she's still sitting in jail. I don't know if you have any updates on that, Walter. I, I have. I, I do not have a bat phone <laughs> to the uh, Benton County Jail, but I don't know what I what I might have missed since the show started sure. this morning. Um, initially reported very few details at this at this time. Um, apparently, the homeowner. Uh, called 911 at 4.45 a.m. Monday morning, discovered a person in their residence. Uh, the responding uh, officers found the alleged burglar made the arrest, transported that person to Becker County's jail's uh, office. Very few details um, are available. Uh, she won her seat in Woodbury, Minnesota Senate, uh, by over 17 points. Um, she's not up for re-election until 2026. Some of the things that I pointed out as we wait for further details on this, though, and some things that you noticed online as well, um, was the the way the media covered this, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, Kurt Doubt made a comment as well, first-degree burglary, um, according to Minnesota statute, mandatory six-month sentence. Um, and again, allegedly because the home was, was occupied in all of this. And I've heard some rumors swirling around this may have been a relative's house. There may have been some confusion there, but it seems like not everybody is buying that. So there's kind of the, the framework on this. Your thoughts on uh, on what's transpired? Yeah, let's talk about the rumors real quick. I don't know that anybody's buying that. And I've only heard it a couple of places. And again, it's totally unsubstantiated and do take this with a huge grain of salt. But the rumor is that's floating around on social media uh, that Senator Mitchell, is it, mm -hmm. um, was visiting the home of her stepmother. Uh, her father is apparently recently deceased. Mm -hmm. And that the stepmother has some form of dementia, woke up in the middle of the night, thought she was an intruder, called the police, and that's what led to this. 
that doesn't pass the sniff test uh, because what you would have to believe in order for that sequence of events to be true, the sequence of events, by the way, that's ongoing, right? Like to the best of our knowledge, she's still in jail. Um, She was arrested. She was booked. What you have to believe is that the police responded to a report of a burglary in progress, got to the house, found no sign of break in, found a daughter asleep, a stepdaughter asleep on a couch who would have identification and the means to prove that she was, in fact, the stepdaughter and that it was her father's house. And her car's parked in the driveway where a car rationally would be if she was visiting. And here's where I've been sleeping. Here's my pillow and my blanket. Like, you would be able to demonstrate. And you could also probably produce medical records of stepmom has dementia. Right. So there's all sorts of ways in which you would be able to get the police to see what this is and either avoid arrest or immediately be released from detention. Right. Um. That obviously didn't happen. 651-989-5855 is the phone number. We're going to get more into this, including the way the media was was covering this here in just uh, a few minutes. State Representative Walter Hudson is going to hang out with us a little bit longer. We'll uh, get his thoughts as well on the students that marched against the school board member. After the member threatened to stall the budget, elections have consequences, people. And we will also revisit um, the health insurers being required to cover the gender-affirming care for minors under the DFL bill. And this fits in um, with the conversation that we were just having a few minutes ago. So don't go anywhere. If you have any comments, any questions, leave us a talk back on the iHeartRadio app. You can email justice at iHeartMedia.com or give us a call, 651-989-5855. AM 1130, 1035 FM. John Justice, producer Robbie. Candidate running against Senator Amy Klobuchar. Joe Frazier joining the show at 830 this morning. Right now, State Representative Walter Hudson running through a number of different issues, including the story that broke yesterday. Minnesota State Senator arrested on first degree burglary accusation. Now, that is... um, how the version of the headlines relating to the story of this DFLer arrested in Detroit Lakes. Uh, the the um, Detroit Lakes is in the county seat of Becker County, sits some 217 miles from her own Woodbury home. Just got confirmation on X of somebody who went and looked at the inmate list for Becker County, and she is <laughs> still sitting in jail as of 30 minutes ago. So that continues to um, sort of call into question some of the rumors going around. And again, these are just simply rumors of what we heard potentially may have happened that um, the, the individual in the house, the, the, the husband had passed away recently. Uh, the woman living in the house has dementia. She's related and perhaps she went in and there was some mistaken identity. Doesn't really, when you begin to break it down, uh, make a whole lot of sense, especially if she's still sitting in jail. Currently. Right, right. And by the way, the the source of this rumor, just to put some context on it, supposedly, and again, this is all unsubstantiated, uh, this, this, supposedly this rumor has been generated by Democrats in an attempt to feed the media a plausible explanation for Mitchell's behavior. It's like they need to feed the media anything. They already weren't posting. They were posting the most, you know, the nicest photos of her attached to all the stories without right. mentioning which party she belonged to in the right. headline. Yeah, and let me just speak to the media directly in reaction to that. The very obvious bias being shown in how this has been reported, the not mentioning the party affiliation, not showing the mugshot, showing very flattering file photos of Senator Nicole Mitchell in this story. Um, Listen, we see what you're doing. And yeah, we know you don't care. And (laughs) yeah, we know that this is baked into the cake and that complaining about it is useless. But listen, this is for your own good. Like what I'm saying here is for your own good, media. You have a trust issue. Like, the value proposition that you offer to the public is journalism. The idea that you're playing it down the middle, you're calling it balls and strikes as you see them, that you're playing it honest, that you're delivering the news, the facts, 
That's the value proposition of picking up a newspaper. That's the value proposition of clicking on a link from a quote unquote uh, journalistic news source. It's gotten to the point where nobody sees that value proposition anymore, and it's obvious in how poorly you're doing financially. There used to be, it used to be, when I started in, you know, 28 years now, and and, uh, 20 years of that has been doing talk radio. And I remember when the adage was, hey, whatever press you get is good press. It didn't Mm -hmm. matter, positive or negative, didn't matter. I've been in radio long enough to see that switch. It's no longer the case when it comes to um, commentary, uh, talk radio being done. Uh, there is a level of truth to that. However, with the ability that people have and the fear that's out there to uh, go after you know, and talk show hosts and cancel culture and things of that nature, there is often it's often not worth it to do that because there's a lot of pressure that can be applied to corporations and all that. I say all that because, in my opinion, it still applies to the media. And it boggles my mind that all you have to do is report the truth, report right. all the different angles. Right. You will probably get criticism and complaints from one particular party over it, but their objections will not be on any kind of merit right. if you're doing your job appropriately. And you know what? Your ratings will go up. You got Your it. viewership will skyrocket. Your comments and clicks online will also go up because that still applies to you if you just did your job. And that's the aspect of it that simply boggles my mind, where the politics and the bias has really impacted them to the point where they are willing to affect their bottom line. Oh, yeah. To appease the party that they are beholden to. Well, and we see it like with Disney, right? So <laughs> D- Disney... When I was growing up, when you were growing up, Disney meant family entertainment. It was the state of the art of family entertainment, meaning something that you could bring your children to, something that was timeless, classic. Disney classic meant something back in the day. Yeah. And, and it meant it was timeless. You could show it beyond the generations. You know, grandma watched it. Now we're showing uh, the grandchild. And they equally enjoy it. Now it's turned into they hate half their audience. And it's very obvious and apparent. And they, their executives have been caught on tape saying they hate half their audience. And it has affected their bottom line. And what's most terrifying is that they don't seem to care. It's not about the money. It's not about the profit. They don't actually have a profit motive. But what I guess I'm trying to appeal to, since they don't have a profit motive, is, is there a sense, sense of self-preservation? Because, because the, the fact, fact of the matter is, is the, the only reason why we have a civil order is, is because of what degree of trust remains in the institutions that hold it aloft. Yeah. And the media is one of those institutions. So, so the more that we weaken trust in the media, the more that we weak, weaken trust in government, the more that we weaken trust in academia, all of these institutions whose trust level has just plummeted because they have each in turn decided to actively reject and work against half the population at a minimum. Um, That leads us to a very dangerous place. And we're seeing that right now. It's predominantly the left that's out there in the street causing trouble and it's being tolerated because it's all part of the plan. But when the other side decides they've had enough, it's going to look very different. Let's go to the uh, comments from the iHeartRadio app. Morning, guys. Gonzo. John, I hate to tell you, but Senator Mitchell, if convicted, will not do mandatory six months in jail. Um, If you read David Zimmer from the American Experiments uh, article on departures, you'll find that it doesn't happen in Minnesota. Departures are the regular norm. And mandatories are not imposed. Thank you for the uh, for the talk back, uh, Gonzo. Uh, let's touch upon this briefly, and then uh, coming up, we'll dive into uh, both the uh, issue of money to uh, illegals and the insurance gender affirming care. But your quick thoughts, uh, Walter. We covered this earlier in the show, working in conjunction with school board members Zach Arco and Linda uh, Hokeman. Uh, you have Matt Audet issuing that post on social media last week, outlining his priorities for the budget. 
uh, saying he, that he's going to vote against the budget if it includes these left-wing priorities. He had students marching. We played the story from uh, from Kara Levin, mm-hmm. um, you know, marching to the meeting. And again, speaking to the media, not doing their due diligence on this. You've got juniors out there saying, I can't believe this is happening to us. Um, it, it hurts me knowing this can happen to anybody. Of course, the media doesn't bother, bother with the follow-up question of what exactly happened to you. Correct. Um, but – this is how the battles need to be waged. We mm-hmm. all know, unfortunately, elections have consequences. Mm-hmm. I hope these three board members all hold firm in uh, what they're doing uh, currently, uh, because this is where we this is where we've landed in dealing with these particular issues. But I certainly want to get your thoughts. Yeah, yeah you've, you've got, got it absolutely right. right. This, this is exactly, exactly what needs to happen. It's what I've been advocating for. Uh, the, the lesser magistrates need to stand up and stand firm and stand against the destructive mandates that are being imposed on them from the top down. I mean, that's more true now than ever after this nonsense that Biden pulled with Title IX, trying to transform a provision that was meant to protect women into a provision that erases them and destroys them and leaves them no space where they're safe. I mean, the only appropriate reaction to that is to just say no and not comply. And yes, We We are are into civil civil disobedience territory. territory. We We absolutely are. And it is just, that's that's the the difference between between civil disobedience and just outright crime, is when you're actually protesting an unjust law uh, and and are doing so in order to highlight the injustice of it. Um, That's that's not not what these students are doing, though. Right. Okay. What What these students students are doing is they are proving these school board members' point. We are are churning out out kids who are kind of dumb. Mm -hmm. That's the way they want them. They're They're kind of dumb. dumb. They want them dumb. And And we we know know that statistically, statistically, based based upon upon how the academic performance performance, uh, is is being documented, documented. we We also also know that uh, because because their priority priority is diversity diversity and inclusion and acceptance and affirmation. affirmation. None None of those those are are academic terms terms or or concepts. concepts. Those Those are are political political concepts. Those Those are are ideological ideological concepts. And that's that's what the the schools schools are churning out. Ideological political political activists, not not people people who are capable of producing value in the economy and supporting supporting themselves, themselves, their their future future families families, and their their community, community, but but people who believe that their sole purpose, purpose, that their their supreme embodiment embodiment and 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 achievement and actualization is the the dismantling dismantling of all of our institutions institutions and and social social norms. Talking with State Representative Walter Hudson coming up. Representative Isaac Schultz calls out uh, out Dems and their handouts to illegals. We have the audio of that. And we'll also get into Representatives Finke and uh, and, uh, Breon Curon lying on the House floor about the parental role in minor transactions, transitions. We'll get to that coming up here on Twin Cities News Talk. Your talk back of the day coming up. Just after 8.30 this morning, tomorrow morning, you're another opportunity for you to pick up tickets to the sold-out Vikings draft party taking place on Thursday night at U.S. Bank Stadium. Congrats to the winner earlier this morning. State Representative Walter Hudson spending some time with me this morning. John Justice here on Twin Cities uh, News Talk. I want to play this audio on just a portion of it. This is Representative Isaac Schultz uh, talking about the budget and how much money will be spent on those that have come into the country illegally. What percentage of the state budget should be spent on people who are here illegally? I would like to know if Representative Hill would yield to that question. Representative Hill uh, will not yield to the question. Would Representative Rehm yield to the question? I see Representative Rehm is not on the floor. Would Representative Cha yield to a question? Representative Cha will not yield to a question. Representative Schultz. Would Representative Cleavorn yield? Representative Cleavorn will not yield to a question. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would Representative Long yield to a question? Representative Long will not yield to a question. And my understanding is, uh, State Representative Walter Hudson, this went on for, uh, this goes on for another minute or so, but all 10 uh, DFLers did not provide any commentary to what his, to his very relevant question. Is that correct? It is correct. And it's also noteworthy that that is a violation of the custom and usage of the House. Oh! It is considered good form, although not required for a member to yield to a question by another member on the floor. In this case, a significant portion of their caucus did not. And we know why, because they can't answer the question, right? 
I mean, I mean it's and, and also, also I, I, th- I think the key, the key point, point of, of that, that brilliant exchange, exchange and brilliant performance on the floor by, by Representative Isaac Schultz, Schultz by the way. I think, I think the key, key takeaway, takeaway from that is how undemocratic the Democrat Party is in the state of Minnesota. Because if you actually were democratic in the literal meaning of the word, meaning that you believe that the people ought to rule, then the people must be informed. The people must know what it is that they are voting on. And if you are not willing to answer the question, how much of your money do you think we should spend on illegal immigrants? Then, then you, you are, are not, not willing, willing to inform the voters, the voters who you're going to turn around, around this November and ask for their support. That, that is anti-democratic. That is undemocratic. And, and this is how they operate, operate. right now. This session has been dominated by efforts to conceal what it is that they both have done and are doing for electoral purposes. It's a different. It's like a, it's a whole other level. What you just described because on the other hand we have the story here from alpha news i covered it a bit yesterday and we'll talk uh, about what was mentioned here but um regarding the health care insurance companies that do business in minnesota being required to cover gender affirming care for children and adolescents under this bill that passed in the state house on wednesday of last week you do have these representatives that are speaking specifically to that and we'll talk to their statements however it doesn't go much beyond Alpha News. This doesn't go much out to the media that we were complaining about earlier. What you're describing is, at least in my mind, how far can we push it by the DFLers? Can we actually get to a point now where we just don't even bother addressing it anymore? I mean, they've already stifled debate. You know, the media is ignoring him, and now they've taken it the next step of not even bothering to even lay out their rationale for why or, you know, or explain why it is they're going to vote the way that they are. You know, it's almost as if it's like a trial balloon on their part to see how far can we how far can we go before somebody notices. And unfortunately, it looks like they can go as far as they want at the moment. Well, well listen, I think both sides of the divide <clears throat> are run run by by old school politicians, politicians, right? Like it's just the nature of how the power dynamics work within a political party and within legislative caucuses where the people who've been there the longest tend to have the the control of the strategy. And that is a disadvantage for both sides because the electoral landscape and the political landscape and the communications landscape has changed so rapidly in recent years that the the old strategies that used to work are are no no longer going to work anymore. So you used to be able to do things like run out the clock Mm -hmm. and then play stupid. You used to be able to do things like put stuff in a huge omnibus bill and then force a vote on it and then pretend as though your opponent voted against something good when in actuality they were voting against something bad. Like the problem with that types of strategies nowadays is that people have the, the, their, Access to information has become so much more sophisticated and laser focused in terms of social media and the ability to break these things down. And, you know, I've been using those channels and other representatives and senators are using those channels. And I think increasingly with each new wave of freshmen that come into these caucuses, you're going to see more and more sophistication in the use of social media and the use of diversified communication methods to work around the mainstream and shine a light into these shadowy places where the powers that be have been hiding what they're actually doing and what the actual effect of their policies and legislation is, that it's going to drive us to a place that forces greater and greater transparency and, as a result, greater and greater honesty if you want to survive politically long term. I think it's a good thing. We only have a, uh, a few minutes left, but I wanted to give you the opportunity to comment on this. We covered this a bit yesterday. You did have 70 DFL House members voted to pass uh, the Omnibus com- uh, Commerce Bill. Contains dozens of new consumer protection measures, including a provision authored by Representative Lee Finke that would prohibit a health plan that covers physical or mental services from excluding coverage for medically necessary gender affirming care. Now, uh, Representative Ann New uh, Brindley uh, did offer an amendment to mandate the coverage for gender affirming care to individuals 21 or older. That amendment was struck down. Um, 
the arguments that were made by New Brindley, this amendment simply says that we're removing the medical procedures from that mandate. There are long-term permanent consequences to these decisions. Uh, Finke disputed the claim, arguing that trans people are overwhelmingly better by gender-affirming care. And then going on to say, if gender-affirming care is health care, then it's not up to us to determine at what age someone should have access to their health care. And there were also some comments by uh, Brian Curran with regard to this as well. I wanted to give you the opportunity to comment on this. Yeah, that reminds me of Luke Skywalker's line in The Last Jedi where he says, that's incredibly impressive. Every word of what you just said is wrong. <laughs> I mean, there's there's... There's literally no word in Finky's response that is correctly applied to reality. Um, if gender affirming care is health care, it's not. Poisoning kids is not health care. By definition, shopping kids apart is not health care. By definition, so you're, if you're, the way arguments work is you offer a premise and then you offer some supporting evidence and a conclusion. Well, your premise just collapse like a Jenga tower. So everything else you say is automatically irrelevant, but let's go on to examine it. Um, the second part of the claim is that we, <laughs> we, nobody should be able to tell anybody at any age what healthcare options they have available to them. What is a parent? Can you define that word for me, please? Can you describe the role that a parent plays in the life of a child? It's nothing but telling your kids what to do. It's I nothing think, I don't but. think they can. I don't think they can tell you what a parent is anymore. No. Well, and they obviously don't respect that relationship. And there's there's other there there was another situation in that same debate on the House floor where both uh, Kern and Finky got up and full uh, uh, feliciously tried to pretend that parents are at the heart of these decisions. I had a meeting this past week with four mothers whose daughters are undergoing transition at whatever stage against their will, against their consent. Many of them groomed into it by their schools without the parents' knowledge, okay? And that the Democrats, as a party, are for that. They are for taking your children, abusing them mentally and emotionally to drive them to the point where they, where they as a minor, will, quote, consent, unquote, to irrevocably altering their bodies, and you don't even know it's happening. That's what the Democrats are for. And so the, the portrayal of that as health care rather than child abuse should be, frankly, criminal. Yeah. And I think most people would agree if they were actually aware of what's going on. But that gets to the heart of what we were discussing earlier. And we are out of time. State Representative Walter Hudson, as always, thank you for hanging out this morning, especially for extended time. I yep. appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Look forward to talking to you again next week if I don't talk to you before then.